Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Chris Cave with Win911 Tech Support, and we'll be covering some general troubleshooting for Win911 2021. I don't mind answering questions along the way, so you're welcome to pop out the question box, submit me a question, and I will answer it when I get a chance. Also, this meeting will be recorded, so it should be available. Usually, it becomes available tomorrow morning, and you should receive a follow-up email with a link where you can view the recording if you'd like. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So here's some of the topics we're going to be covering. The Win Number One Log Viewer, that's like the bread and butter of determining which alarms are coming into Win Number One. Our backend for Win Number One is a SQL Server, and sometimes you do have to add users if you want another user to be able to access the Win Number One Log Viewer. And then we have our services when everything runs as Windows services, all the Win Number One services. And then the security configuration tool is what lets you change the user who runs those services, or you can update the password for those services. Windows Event Viewer, never under, underestimate that one. It's perfect for troubleshooting what Windows, the Win Number One services are doing. We have our own log section under the Event Viewer, so you can access that, and I'll show you how to do that. And then we never talk about Window Module Mapper that much. Module Mapper is what syncs the services to the database. So sometimes it's useful to, for resolving issues where it's, things aren't lining up right in your, work, in your Win Number One workspace. And because Win Number One is now a desktop app, we cache everything inside the desktop app. And sometimes you may need to clear that cache. And I will show you how to do that today. And then we're going to be covering some troubleshooting for the voice with GrandStream and then with the Sierra Wireless for the SMS gateways. Okay. Let me get my trusty laser pointer and we'll get started. So starting with Log Viewer, I'm guessing a lot of people have seen this already, but one thing to point out is that we have the two tabs. The Alarms tab is showing you individual alarms that are coming in. The Notification tabs is the quick summary of what alarm came in, who, got, who, accept, who received those notifications, and who acknowledged the alarm. And so if you're trying to do a report on your alarms and who acknowledged them, the notification tabs is probably the better one. I'd also like to point out the auto update. This is the live feed of alarms. If you uncheck this, you can see your historical data if you'd like. And then we have an export option over here. This will let you export. And then we have a settings where you can add different columns if you want. So let's go into a bit more detail about that. So on our notifications tab, here we have a quick summary, whether or not the alarm is acknowledged or uh, what state it's in. And, what notifications got sent out. And so if you're trying to look for a report of something that happened yesterday, we could always uncheck this box here, set our date range, and then export the list that we want there. Now, real quick, if we're on the Alarms tab here and we double click on any one of these rows, we can double click or drill down into this particular alarm and see the properties for that particular alarm, the notifications, who acknowledged, all that stuff. And I'll show you that here in just a second. So this is where I'm on the alarms tab. I just double clicked on alarm so I can now drill down into it and see the notifications that got sent out here. And this is useful for troubleshooting for whether or not your, your notifications are actually sending. Because what Win Number One will do is use the dispatcher service to start formulating the message and dispatch it. And then it will tell us whether it failed or succeeded. So this was the mobile dispatching. And then it tells me that it was successful. And so if the user is not receiving their actual mobile notification on their phone, here we can kind of isolate it. We know that we made, we sent the message to Microsoft, but for some reason it's not making it to the user's phone. So it usually tells me I need to troubleshoot something on the user's phone itself. Now, if I see the failure here instead, if I saw a failure, I could highlight it. And down here at the bottom, it would show me some additional information. And a failure usually means that Win Number One's uh, mobile gateway was not able to hit Microsoft. So it lets you know that you need to troubleshoot it from the Win Number One server perspective. Same is true with email and SMS and the uh, voice as well. You should always see a dispatching and then whether it fails or not or if it's a success. So if we got a success with the email here, we would know that uh, if the user didn't receive their email, then we know it's something between the mail server and the user. If we see a failure here, then we know it's between Win Number One and the mail server. So it helps you isolate it. It still can be 
difficult to troubleshoot what's actually the problem is, but it let's, at least cuts it down to where you can acknowledge or see what side the problem is on. So then if we switch to the acknowledgement tab here, we can see if the alarm was acknowledged successfully. And this is also useful, useful for troubleshooting if acknowledges are getting back to the SCADA. So for example, here, I received an alarm notification on my mobile app, I acknowledged it. So the first one here is telling me that when number one was able to acknowledge it, no problem. Then when number one will reach out to the SCADA and request permission to acknowledge it on the SCADA. And if it accepts that, then we see the second one via source. So whenever you see a via source one, it means it updated properly on the SCADA. Sometimes you might just see via source, and that would mean that they acknowledge the alarm from the SCADA instead of from Win Number One. So then we can get into the policy execution and determine uh, what the policy is happening, what events or what tactic, rather notification policy, did we start? And then if there was any alarm state changes and if we re-notified anyone, and then if the alarm, uh, how the alarm stop policy or the notification policy stops, and it will let us know there. Then we can do our call flow. This will be based on your notification policy, who gets called in what order, and this will show you in the order that people get, uh, get called. And what it can also tell you is if someone's not on schedule, it would say that it was skipping that person because they're not on schedule. So if someone didn't receive the alarm and then you come in here to check, you could see if it actually sent to them or not. And if it said something like skipping, then it usually means that they weren't on schedule for that. And then our last tab is the state changes, any state changes that took place here. Okay, so going back in the log viewer, I kind of pointed this out already. If you want to see historical data, just uncheck the auto update, set your date range, and then you can export if you want. And that will export the list of all the alarms in this, from the alarm tab. Same is true on the notifications. If we switch to the notifications side, just a quick summary, uncheck the box, set our date range, hit our export, it's gonna export that list of what we have. If you have nothing in here and you try to export, it's just gonna give you an empty file. So usually the best practice is to uncheck the auto update, set your date and time range, and then export. Now SQL is our backend for Win Number One, and each service, each Win Number One service has its own log. Uh, .log is actually the log viewer database. So any of that historical data that's in the log viewer gets put in here. And then here we have an example of using system platform. So this would be our system platform runtime with this Orchestra database. Dispatcher service is the middleman. It does all the heavy lifting, formulates the message to get it ready. So this is a database for that. Uh, and if you were to try to look at this one, this is where you would see like who your users are, your contacts directory, uh, what notification policies you have, things of that sort. Email would be your email gateway, the configuration. So any email users you created will be stored in there. And then whatever email server you're using will be stored in there. Then we have in touch and so on. Now, the part, part I want to point out is under the security logins folder, these are the users that are able to access Win Number One. And right now, I only have my one user that I have, my Win Number One user. But if I wanted to switch the account that Win Number One uses for all the services, I would need to add that user here first as a sysadmin, and then I can use our security configuration tool to change that user. This is also true if you want another user to be able to use Log Viewer. And so what I mean that by that is that Windows lets you have different people log into that Windows computer. So if you installed everything with an admin account, got everything to work with Windows number one through an admin account, and then you log out of that account, log out of Windows with that account, log in with an operator account, if the operators want to be able to open Log Viewer, they will need to be added here with read write permissions. Okay. Now we're going to get into the services, the Win Number One services. So this is under Windows, Windows services. And after you install, you'll see all our Win Number One services. And during the install process, you get you choose which account you want all the services to run as. And so you're kind of stuck with this one. And and unless you want to change it, you would have to add the other user to SQL. Uh, maybe you, the password changed for this account. So you could again use that security configuration tool to update the password. And then all of our services are dependent on code meter now with the new version. So if you wanted to restart when number one services quickly without rebooting, you could just restart the code meter runtime and it will prompt you to restart all the when number one services at the same time. And just got to kind of run down it. So this is a data source connection to InTouch Edge. So if you're using Edge, you might see something like this. 
where this is the data source where when the alarm trips in the SCADA, this runtime is what's picking it up. Once the alarm comes into wind level one, then we're using our dispatcher service to formulate the message, get it prepared, or who's gonna get called in what order, or who's gonna receive an email or mobile. And then from there, dispatcher reaches out to whatever notifier connection they're using. So if it was sending an email to someone, it would reach out to the email runtime, which connects to your email gateway to be able to send that email out. If they're using mobile, this is where dispatcher would talk to mobile to be able to send out that notification. Navigation is part of the Win Number One workspace, the desktop app that you open to configure Win Number One. And then reporting is something where you can request reports if you have that set up or push a report if you like. And then our SMS runtime, that is if you're using an SMS modem. So this is where a dispatcher is gonna to talk to your SMS service to be able to send out an SMS text if needed. And then we have our system platform runtime. If I was using system platform, this would be the data source connection for that. And then the voice runtime, which is again a, a notifier. So dispatcher is really the one talking to the voice runtime if you're trying to send out a voice call. The voice runtime is also responsible for talking to the grand stream device. Same is true with the SMS. The SMS is what's talking to your Sierra wireless. And then mobile is what's talking to your to Microsoft in this case for the Azure cloud services. And then email is whatever you set up. If you set up a free Gmail account and this email runtime would basically be the responsible for talking to your smtp.gmail.com. Or if it was Outlook, it would be smtp.outlook.com. Okay. So yeah, again, I just kind of want to point out that uh, we run everything as a spe specific account. And so what happens during your, your install for Win number one, the very first thing it does is prompt you for, for creating a SQL instance, and you can choose to create a SQL instance or not. And one thing to note about that is whatever user you're logged into Windows with at the time when you go to create that first SQL instance will become the very first system admin for that SQL database for Win number one. And so if I'm logged in, let's say with a local built-in administrator account, which we don't recommend, we recommend you creating a, a user, throwing it into the local admin group, and then log into Windows with that account. So that's precisely what I did here. I created a user called Win Number One, logged into Windows with that account, and then started the Win Number One install. So when it inst when it prompted me to install SQL, it made this account as the very first sysadmin. So let's say later on everything's said and done and I log out of my win number one user and I log in with the operator account, that's where it's gonna have trouble talking to log viewer. Log viewer will try to open, you'll get a SQL error because my other user, my other Windows user is not in SQL as with read write permissions. Then the same is true if you want to switch this, let's say you decided you're gonna use a different account to run these services. Maybe you switched over to a domain or you wanna use a, a domain service account or something like that. You want to follow the same process where you put that user into the local administrator group for that machine, and then you'll need to open up SQL Studio Manager. But in order to do that, you would have to be logged in with the original user from that you used to install SQL. So I'd have to be logged in with Win Number One at the time, open up my SQL Studio Manager, add my operator account or my my domain account to SQL as a sysadmin. And then I can use our security configuration manager to switch the services to all of this. But again, the, the big thing I really want to point out is whatever user you're logged into Windows with when you install Win Number One SQL database is the only sysadmin of that database. So if you need to make any changes, just make sure to log into that account. And it's probably not a bad idea to add other accounts just in case someone changes the password or and they don't remember what they changed it to or something like that. Okay. So this is the Windows Security Configurator uh, Configuration Manager. It, it will be available in the Windows Start menu under the Win Number One folder. And this is what allows you to change the account or update the password. So here I am, this is my service account that you saw earlier, my, and it's indicating the dot backslash is indicating that's a local account, not a domain. On this previous screen right here, it's basically saying this is a local account. If it was a domain account, we would usually see domain slash and then the user. But here we are, this is my local my local user. And if, if let's say my password changed and all I need to do is update my password, I would just put in the new password here, hit apply, and that would update all the services with the new password. And then if you wanted to change the account, again, this assumes that you've already added the new account to SQL as sysadmin. 
And then we could just type in the account name or hit browse to browse our users on this Windows machine. We switch it, put in the password for that account, hit apply. And what that'll do is change all these services to run as that new account. All right. Another thing is we, I don't recommend using this network service anymore. It was something that we tried to do with the new version, but it's just not working out as well because most of the SCADAs kind of do this too, where you have to have a specific account. Usually that account can't change or that password can't change without breaking your, uh, your SCADA configuration. So usually I recommend just making it a specific service account for the same user you're probably using to run your SCADA for, the user that you'll probably log in with every day. And then secure network. So all these services here talk to each other with encryption with security on. And if you turn this off, it basically just turns off that encryption. And it might be useful if you're trying to troubleshoot permission issues on the local machine with, uh, with a machine that's got all the services running locally. Where I do possibly recommend it is on a local network where you have different Win number one modules installed across your network. So you may have like dispatcher and navigation and whatnot on your main server. And then you might have a, a voice module, Win number one voice, and, and maybe the mobile on a different computer. And they would have their own services on the other computer and they would talk across your local network with encryption with this enabled. Okay. And I just want to make sure, actually, before I switch out of this, if there's any more questions based around the security manager, uh, its main focus, again, is to update your password that runs your services, or if you want to change the account that the services run. And if there's any questions about that, let me know. Okay. All right, so now let's get into Windows Event Viewer. And Windows Event Viewer comes with every Windows system, Windows 10, Windows 2012, uh, server and up and then Windows 10 and up. It was on previous versions of Windows as well, but the easiest way to get to it is to right click on the Windows Start button and then in the right click menu, you'll see Event Viewer up at the top usually. And then what we do is we expand the applications and services logs and then our Win number one will have its own logging underneath there. And then earlier I talked about the services. So each service writes its own log in our Win number one log itself. So if I was troubleshooting in touch data source connection, I could look at the source for, for that one. If I was troubleshooting dispatcher, I would see when number one dispatcher source runtime and so on. And then you can use filter current, current log if you wanted to change filter just on the same source, maybe you just wanna look at the voice stuff. So we could use the filter to do that. Um, clearing log is also important because sometimes these logs do fill up, take up space. So you might want to just clear it out. You can always save the file, uh, save the log somewhere else first if you want, and then clear it out of here. And then don't underestimate the Windows log itself. Under Windows logs, you have the system logs, which usually tells you of services, whether services are starting properly or not. And then the application log will tell you if any of our services are crashing, possibly from a, a .NET error or something like that. So you, you can always use those as well for troubleshooting. We will write stuff there just based on .NET. Now module mapper. So module mapper I mentioned earlier is a way for the services to sync with the database to make sure everything's set up properly there. Uh, the best time to use it is if you wanted to uninstall a module. Maybe you don't want SMS anymore, so you go to uninstall SMS module from control panel. I would always recommend running the module mapper after that just to make sure you it did disappear and everything else is synced up. And then I would also clear the workspace cache, which I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, also useful if you plan on installing a module after the fact. So maybe you didn't install mobile, but you decided you wanted to use mobile. We could install the mobile module itself and then run module mapper to make sure that it's listed and everything's synced up properly. And I would still clear workspace cache and, and then you should be good to go. Now I have seen it with other, I've seen it fix other issues as well. So let's say you're in workspace and you're trying to assign a notification policy to an alarm and you hit the notification policy dropdown menu and it's blank. Even though you have notification policies built, for some reason that menu is blank or that dropdown is blank. So that would really be my first step is run module mapper and make sure everything lines up. Click save because what save is gonna do is validate with SQL. And if there's any issues with SQL, you're gonna get an error that will help us troubleshoot. If everything saves successfully, that's great. And then you restart the Win number one services that I showed you earlier by restarting the code meter runtime. 
and then uh, that would probably most likely fix the issue. I've seen it fix that issue quite a bit. So when the next time you go back in the workspace, you try to assign a notification policy to alarm, you should see all your notification policies now in the drop down menu. All right, so this is clearing workspace cache. There's two places where we clear it. One is the program data folder. And so if we did a percent program data percent in here and hit enter, it would take us to the program data folder. And then from there, we can open up the work, uh, Win number one software, open up the workspace cache. And this is all the cache. You would actually delete all these files under the cache folder. And then the next time you reopen workspace, it'll rebuild the cache. So this is also useful for situations where perhaps the workspace performance is slow or perhaps there's things not showing up properly or things aren't uh, moving the way you want, then my first step would be to close workspace, clear this cache out, and then we're gonna clear the other part of the cache and then reopen workspace and see if that resolves it. So again, first step is program data, clearing the cache under the workspace cache folder. And then our second step is going to the application data folder. Now, if you just do percent app data percent, it's gonna take you to the roaming section first. So you'd have to go back to app data, go to local, then the Win number one, and then delete everything under this folder here. And I can actually demonstrate that. Might make it a little bit easier to demonstrate in a demo. So here, if we go to my demo for a second, and I just open up, I gotta make sure workspace is closed, make sure log viewer is closed. So here, if I come to the top and just do percent app data percent, it's going to take me to the roaming folder here. So I go back one level to app data, go to local, go to win number one, and then delete whatever's under this folder. And then the same is true for app data. We would do percent app data percent, go to the, um, oops, sorry, program data. We would do percent program data percent, and then go to the win number one folder, go to the cache folder, and delete everything underneath here. Okay. So back to the slide deck. Just wanted to see if anyone had any questions for anything. You're welcome to ask anytime. The GoToMeeting, by the way, webinar bar has a question box that you can pull out and you can submit your questions there if you'd like. Okay. So demo, uh, I was just gonna kind of just roughly demo everything I just kind of showed you. Um, this is gonna be a kind of a short meeting. We had an hour plan, but it's really gonna be pretty short because I, I pretty much showed you everything there. Uh, but just quickly, so with Log Viewer, if we're going to open up Log Viewer, and let's say I was logged in with an operator account right now, because uh, right now I'm actually logged in with my Win Number One user, but I could log out and log back in with my operator account. And if I tried to open up Log Viewer right now, I I would see a SQL error. So what I would need to do is log back in with my Win Number One account first because my Win number one account is gonna be the only user at the time with, with access to SQL. And then once I'm logged in with this user, then I can add my operator user. Once I add my operator user and give it sysadmin right, so read write permissions, then I could be logged in with the operator and be able to open up SQL and add other people if I wanted to, depending on what type of permissions you gave them. But this is basically the important part where just making sure that whatever users you want to be able to use Log Viewer on the Win number one server, to make sure that they're in the SQL as a, as a user. I usually just default to giving them sysadmin rights. So if we look at the properties for this user, go to server roles, here we can check that box. But if you're trying to limit them, just know that they need at least read write permissions and in order to use Log Viewer. And then you can add other users if you like here. Okay. All right, so right now I don't have any live data coming in, but if I wanted to, I could uncheck the box and set my date range and see my historical data here. So if I go back, refresh, now I can see my historical data, see what happened. I can double click on one of these to actually see what happened, what notifications went out, and what alarm, uh, what who acknowledged it, and what policy and all that jazz. Always go back, hitting the, the, the arrow there to get back. And then the settings here, most of the time what's here is good, but you might have like an iFix server that has suppressed events and you might want to see if the alarm suppressed or not. So you could open this column up here for, for iFix if you like. I don't think the other SCADAs support that yet. We don't support it with the other SCADAs yet, but with iFix we can do that. So, And then with services, Windows services, 
one thing uh, about changing the password. So what, what it does, like let's say you, you change this account password. I mean, I suppose technically you could come into each service, go to the login tab and type the new password here if you want. But that's where the security configuration tool does it for us. And we could just type it into our, our security configuration tool. So let me just open that real quick and demonstrate how that would work. So this is my Win number one user. And if the password changed, I just type in a new password here, hit apply, and it updates all these services, for the password for all these services for me. And then let's say I decided I want to use a different account. I've already got that operator account in SQL as a sysadmin, so I could always browse here, go to my operator, put in my operator password, hit apply, and it would change all the services for this one here. Okay. And I just want to kind of use this time now because, again, this was probably just going to be a 30-minute session, even though we, we allotted an hour, but there's just not enough content really to go into it that long. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes asking if anyone has any questions about anything, anything you need me to clarify, anything you'd like me to demonstrate. Um, just let me know. Okay. All right. So... We have a uh, voice and SMS troubleshooting here. So this is going to be focused around CR Wireless and the Grandstream modem here. We're going to start with the Grandstream modem. This is what it looks like. This is the, the version that you need. Uh, you can use an older version of Win number one if you want. It has to be 3.19 at 9 to higher. It does not work with V7. And we have some KBE articles on this. We have two types of KBEs, whether or not you purchase this from us. If you did not purchase it from us, then I would recommend going out and searching for that knowledge base article where it did not you, were, you did not purchase it from us because at the bottom of that KB is going to be attached our config file. And that's really the big difference. If you buy it from us, it already has the config file on there. If you don't buy it from us, that's really going to be our, your first step is downloading our config file and uploading it to your Grandstream device. So uh, before we get to that, this is just a little bit of background on how Grandstream works. Win number one will use your local network to talk to the Grandstream device uh, through, through your local network using VoIP and SIP. And then this modem will convert it to an analog. So you're just plugging in a, no, a typical analog line to it. I've had people try to use digital lines. It doesn't work because this modem is meant for an analog line. If you're trying to use a digital line, typically you would have like a SIP, a SIP carrier in the cloud or maybe have a, a PBX in the office. and you don't necessarily need Grandstream for that. You just connect Win number one's voice gateway directly to your PBX or directly to your VoIP system. So, so here is where we're inside the Grandstream web portal. And this would be the very first step you would do if you did not buy the modem from us. If you did buy the modem from us, it would already have this config file. So again, you go out to our knowledge base article, you download this file from the KB, and then use this upload to upload the file here. And then you would use this restore button over here to restore it. And that's gonna put it into a state where it has the configuration except for the customer's IP. And so that would be your very next step is configuring it for the customer's IP address. So this would be under system settings, under network settings. And what the first thing we'll do is switch the method from route to switch. Some of the newer models of Grandstream, it might do this for you already, but if you ever see method as route, that means the, the modem's trying to act like a router and you don't want that. It may work with calls, but at some point it's gonna fail. And so this would be the very first thing I would check is to make sure the method is as a switch, which basically turns the Grandstream into like a dumb switch. Okay, so we have a quick question. Can you export an alarm report on older versions of Windows One? Uh, I'm trying to remember when we actually included that feature for log viewer. I want to say it was in the, the 20, 4.21, that range. It might have even been as old as 4.20. I'm not sure if 4.19 was able to do that. Sorry about that, Andy. I can double check that for you at, at, towards the end of the session and see if I can find that answer for you. Okay. So another thing we have to do is the IP method because uh, the screen in the beginning is going to show WAN, WAN, and LAN uh, configuration, but ultimately it just needs to be a LAN configuration. So as soon as you change the IP method to static, that's when it just becomes LAN, and that's where you would update the IP address to be on the customer's network. And so just making sure all that's set. And that's typically all you have to do there. Uh, I don't usually have to touch much after that. 
it says usually this is the, the big one to make sure that Wyndham One is actually able to talk to the Grandstream device. All right, so once we got that set, then we can determine if Wyndham One is actually connecting to it. Under extensions, we will see the status here. If it says unavailable, that means that Wyndham One is not able to connect to it or register it to it. And it could be a network issue or it could be as simple as a password issue. If it does say available, then that means that Wyndham One is communicating with it. And here's where you can kind of break down troubleshooting. If this says available and I try to do a test call from Wyndham One to Grandstream and it still fails, then we know something's still wrong possibly with the network or with the Grandstream configuration. And so, uh, sorry, let me take that back. What I would suggest is, um, if let, let me rephrase that, sorry. So if we did a test call from win number one and it fails, even though this said available, then we would wanna do a test call from Grandstream. Because in Grandstream, we can take win number one out of the loop, do a test call, and then determine if that fails or not. Most likely it's gonna fail. So we'd we know the issues between Grandstream and the carrier. But if it does work, then I would be really confused because we might need to, we might need to check something, but I, I, I don't usually see a failure when we see available here that's caused by win number one or the configuration of win number one at that point. But uh, you can always open a ticket with this and we'll help you figure that out. Now under this one, so this is the extension record. This is basically saying the extension that win number one is trying to use to be able to make calls through Grandstream. And if we wanted to, we could come over here and edit this profile. And this is something else that's important to check because one of the problems you could have is when number one's password, whatever password you put in when number one workspace for extension 1000 may not match uh, what's in here. So if you modify the extension itself, hit the little light bulb here, it'll show you what password's actually being used there. So you can confirm that and then make sure to go update when number one's workspace properly with that password. Also for inbound calling, we need to make sure that the voicemail is disabled because we don't want the Grandstream voicemail picking up when you try to call into Win Number One. So that's typically what we need for the extension. Now for test calling, to actually do test calling, we have to go to the analog trunks. And when we first get to the analog trunk, it's gonna show something similar to when we first got to the extension. So when I first click on analog trunks, it's gonna show a screen similar to this for the trunk. And you'd have to click on the modify button or the, I'm sorry, the edit, the yeah, edit or modify button to get to the next screen that I'm on. So this is going to be the next screen for that here where I'm, I'm modifying the actual trunk record for it. And down here at the bottom right is this detect button. And this is where we can actually place our test call. So we would hit the de detect button. It's going to pop up in a window where we need to set the detect model as semi auto detect. And then we can put in our phone number, one area code and the phone number is the best way to start. Unless they require nine, you know that, then you can dial nine, one area code and phone number. And then you click detect. And what it should do is call you. And if it doesn't, then you usually know that something's wrong between Grandstream and the carrier. If it does work and it's still failing from win number one, then we know the problem is some between win number one and Grandstream. Now, if the issue is between Grandstream and the carrier, the very first thing I would recommend is just make, getting some sort of landline phone, connecting it to your analog line, pick up the phone, make sure you have dial tone, make sure you can dial a number, see what numbers you had to press to be able to make that call. Could the other person hear you? Was there any static? That, that one simple tool like, will help narrow down quite a bit real easily. Because if all that's great and it's, not, it's still not working from, from Grandstream, then we know it's a Grandstream issue or Win number one issue for sure. And we can either redo the configuration file or, or double check whatever settings we have in Windows One's workspace. All right, so now we're gonna get a bit into Sierra Wireless here. We have two flavors, although I think we're having trouble getting uh, parts for this one. I think there's a chip shortage. So I don't know if the RV50X is still out there, but the LX40 is still in stock. And the big difference between these two is what type of environment you want the modem to be in. The light version is meant for a clean office environment, clean server room. The RX RV50X is a harder casing, hardened casing rather, and it's meant for like factory floors, dust, and all that stuff. All right, so Sierra Wireless has a, a portal, a web portal, just like the Grandstream does, where you go, you access the modem and configure the modem through a GUI, which is a hundred times better than dealing with multi-tech in my opinion. 
And one of the best parts is it has its own way of seeing uh, what messages are coming into the modem. So one of the big things that people might do is they want to be able to acknowledge alarms back from the SMS, uh, from the phone, from a text, back to Win number one. And if the acknowledgement is not working, then we can come in here and determine right away where the problem might be. Because when you actually send a text back to the SMS modem, it should show up here as showing the last phone number that, that sent that text and what they tried to send here. And if there's nothing in here, then we know the problem is definitely between the modem and the carrier. Now, if we see stuff in here and acknowledgement still not working, then we know the issues between Win number one and the modem. And so typically those things would be local host IP. This is the static IP address of the Win number one server. And so this is a big one. In order for you to even acknowledge back to Win number one, you have to have this in there. So again, the Win number one server needs a static IP address. And then we, we need to put that Win number one server static IP address here. So that's step one. Step two is if that if Windows firewall is enabled on that Windows server, or if there's a hardware firewall trying to block the ports, typically it's Windows firewall where you would allow an incoming connection to the Win number one SMS runtime. And so let me just demonstrate that real quick if you all don't mind. So here, if we open up Windows firewall and we go to the advanced, what we're trying to do here is create an inbound rule and we're gonna do a new rule we want a program because all we need is the win number one SMS runtime. So we would click next, we would browse. And we're basically just browsing directly to our SMS folder. So program files x86, win number one software, win number one, the SMS folder. And then we just basically pick this notifier.exe and tell it to allow this one. And that's those two steps are usually what fixes probably 90% of my issues or my tickets where acknowledgement back in the Win number one is not working. Okay. Let's go ahead and get back to the slide deck. Okay. So uh, one thing to note too about setting it up, uh, this is about the SMS mode. If the SMS mode does not show control and gateway, then you won't even see this stuff here. So that's one of the very first steps you do with configuring. And our knowledge base article will walk you through this. So you go to services and then SMS, change the SMS mode to control and gateway, and that's going to that's what's going to open up this section here. We make sure that the local host IP is the static IP of our Win number one server, and then we're going to configure the local host port and the alias port as 911. And then I, I kind of mentioned this part already, where again, this is good for troubleshooting incoming messages, so acknowledgement specifically. And then farther down on the page, so I'm still in the same section where I'm on SMS, uh, services, SMS, and I basically just scrolled down here. This is where we can actually test it. So I can set this to national, and then I can put in a phone number here. Now, here's what's weird. Uh, what I noticed is if I just put the phone number in here and then click, click on quit test, it doesn't appear to work. So what I actually have to do is put in the phone number, scroll back to the top and hit apply, and then I can come back down here and click the quick test. And that will let me know if uh, if the user receives an SMS text from the modem itself. So real quick way to narrow down if it's a Win number one issue or a modem carrier issue. If this works, like if they send the text from here and it works, but they're not getting it from Win number one, then you definitely know the problems between Win number one and the modem. If this is failing, then we know the issues between Win number one or the modem and the carrier. Now, a couple of things to note: if the issues between the modem and the carrier, some of the uh, one of the things I would recommend. Oh, and this is sorry, this is kind of a duplicate side where it's talking about making sure you set this. But again, if we're talking about um, this quick test failing here sending and we, we know that the issue now is between the modem and the carrier. Two things I usually would recommend starting is making sure that your, your plan, your texting plan is a simple texting plan. You don't need the extra stuff. You don't need video. You don't need uh, data. You don't need any of that stuff. Just a simple texting plan is what you're looking for when you, when you request it from the carrier. And then they're going to send you a SIM card. And that SIM card needs to be registered properly with the IEMI number of the modem. Each modem has its own unique identifier. And just make sure that the carrier has registered that IEMI 
uh, from the modem itself with the SIM card. Those are usually the first two best places to start. A lot of times that'll solve a lot of the issues right there, but if not, you might have to keep plugging away at it. And if needed, we have logging available in the Sierra Wireless. So here we're going to the admin tab, configure logging, and we're the, the main ones you probably want to turn on is cellular, uh, LAN, we don't really need VPN, um, security and services would be a good one. And then you try making your test, uh, test text or whatever, and then view the log afterwards to see what's going on. And hopefully this will be helpful with determining what type of issues you might have with the carrier. All right, so what is coming up next? It's a big one on, on deck for release five is we're going to have an OPC UA alarms and conditions data source connection. So right now we only provide OPC DA. So if you're interested in OPC UA, that will be released on our R5 release. And that's probably due at the end of summer, I'm guessing. And then something we've been playing around with, we have no ETA on this yet. It's still something we're just trying to work on. We're trying to make it easier for the whole failover situation. Because right now, a lot of that configuration has to be done in your SCADA. Your SCADA is telling which, which uh, Win number one server to be active or standby. And what we're trying to do is make it a little bit more user friendly by making some sort of status module page inside the workspace or somewhere where you can configure that into the workspace. So this is some mock-up ideas that we thought about. This would be showing those services because the Win number one services is Windows services and you can't really see what's going on with them without Event Viewer. So this might be an easier way to see it, what type of errors, warnings, and things of that nature you might be getting. And then what we're hoping to do is be able to create failover conditions based on different situations. Maybe a service fails and you want to tell it to fail over to backup based on that service failing, or maybe uh, like the SMS, the service fails on it. You can always still use the SCADA because SCADAs have their own situation where SCADA A might go down and the SCADA scripting will tell when number one to cut over to backup. So you can still have that option, but you know what to do if like the SMS runtime crashes or when that one's dispatcher crashes, we want to create new failover situations for that. So you can fail over to the hot backup where the dispatcher service is running with no problem. So again, this is mock-up, no ETA on this yet, uh, but it's something we're hoping to add very soon. Okay. And so here is the, uh, what we do with our feature requests, if you go to our website up at the top, there is a send feedback option. This will take you to a page where you can submit your own feature requests that you might like to have, and it makes it available for everyone to view. And the more votes it gets, the more likely we are to add it. So if you're interested in that whole hot backup situation, you might want to go uh, take a look at this and just give it another upvote, because the more it gets, the more priority we put on it. So. All right, well, that is the end of our session. I do really appreciate you all coming out and joining our webinars are always free and we try to do them as often as possible. So you're more than welcome to check out our website on our resources tab. If we go to our, our resources tab here and go to webinars, these are always gonna be our upcoming webinars. So webinars on deck, this is where we registered for this one today. And then we're always doing new user training. We do it at least twice a month. So the next new user training is going to be April 19th. It's typically on a Tuesday, 10.30 uh, a.m. Central Time. So you could go ahead and register for this one now. And this will talk about the new, uh, this is basically a full on hour and a half of new user training, well, about an hour of new user training on the latest version of Win number one.